My most recent Mortarboard podcast, Is Public Higher Education Still Public?, unleashed a torrent of comments from listeners. I titled the podcast as I did because, although the majority of the podcast was about the gradual erosion of funding for public higher education, my guest, Emma Whitford of Inside Higher Ed, included an important fact toward the end that the majority of states now no longer fund the majority of higher education costs and are minority stakeholders. Some offer barely any funding at all, particularly for community colleges. To consider the magnitude of this, consider what your state's K-12 educational landscape would look like if individual families had to pay the majority of the cost of primary and secondary education before their own children could attend school. Now, what's causing this? It's easy to look outward and say that people, including legislators, don't value what we do. But ultimately, people are just responding to the context we provide. So I think it's worth looking at some of our faults. I'm going to speak generally here, and so of course there are schools that will beat the average. If you feel significantly indignant about what I will say, that's what the comment section is for. First, colleges are visibly quite inefficient. I say that not actually by way of criticism, but simply by way of description. The major reason why lowering costs is difficult, although not widely discussed, is what is known as the Bomol effect, sometimes called Bomol's disease. The Bomol effect is the rise of salaries and jobs that have experienced no or low increase in labor productivity in response to rising salaries in other jobs that have experienced higher labor productivity growth. The costs of education rise faster than the costs in other parts of the economy simply because productivity growth in education is slower. Class sizes are largely the same as they were 10 years ago, and time to graduation is the same too. You can take your pick of whatever productivity measure you want to use. It will largely be stagnant. Yet salaries, utilities, and other costs continue to rise. This means that those costs must be passed along to students and taxpayers. We, we see the opposite phenomenon in industries like consumer electronics, where tremendous efficiency and productivity gains have occurred, which then cause prices to drop. But colleges are also inefficient as a result of the choices they make. In my opinion, one of the dirty little secrets of higher education is its relative voluntary inefficiency, especially in the case of small colleges. That is not to say that small colleges should not exist, but rather that small colleges everywhere seem to embrace the easy stuff, but also seem to shy away from efficiencies that run counter to their established culture. For instance, why do community colleges, just a short distance apart from one another and within the same state, use different information systems to run their campuses, when the cost of those systems are based on FTE and become lower when FTE rises? The most common response I've heard to this question is, well, we want to be able to choose our own system. That sounds reasonable, if a bit indulgent, but colleges rarely quantify the extra money they are spending simply because they refuse to partner with other institutions, and as a result, rarely have to answer for costs incurred as a result of those types of inefficiencies. But the problem runs much deeper. It is a fact that over time, more and more colleges have offered more and more degrees to more and more students in ways that do not lead directly to employment. As such, it was only a matter of time before colleges developed a reputation for doing just that. I suggest you Google degrees least likely to lead to employment and settle in for an interesting read. Higher education deserves some skepticism about the value that it adds. And that skepticism is growing among legislators. It's long been argued and demonstrated that a, community, uh, sorry, that a college degree leads to increased earnings. But what if those earnings are no longer translating into financial security and long-term prosperity? For example, uh, a study by researchers at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, which I covered on an earlier podcast, concluded that while college still boosts graduate earnings, it no longer increases their long-term wealth. In the 1930s, white college graduates were worth 247% more than their non-college educated peers. But by 1985, the wealth difference was just 42%. 
the decline was even greater among black graduates. For graduates born in the 1970s and 80s, the wealth difference between them and their non-graduating peers is zero. To gain back students and trust, colleges must offer credentials that lead efficiently to employment for those who want it, and more importantly, colleges must conquer the bias that led to the de-emphasizing of workforce development in the first place. The problem with that bias is not so much that colleges have moved away from being hotbeds of workforce training, it's that they never were. Traditionally, tradespeople learned their trade from other tradespeople, and college was seen as a higher level endeavor. College was accurately described as a marketplace of ideas, not a place to get your hands dirty. However, a shift has occurred in modern industry, causing the majority of skilled trades to become far more sophisticated, far more technical, and to change far more quickly, thus requiring continuous professional development. From cars, to veterinary care, to human health care, to surveying, to forensics, many fields have grown so complex and sophisticated that a dedicated educational environment is a far more appropriate place to develop the skills necessary to handle those complexities than, say, traditional apprenticeships. Even in cases where an apprenticeship is appropriate, it should generally only be seen as a part of a student's formal education. For colleges to fully embrace their appropriate role in workforce development, they must overcome the cultural bias present in American higher education, and they need to do something else as well. A college can offer an English degree with relatively little input from the outside but it cannot offer technical degrees without meaningful dialogue and information sharing between the college and the industries that hire its graduates. To do this, colleges must learn to talk with those same industry leaders that they've excluded from higher education for decades. Although colleges are finally coming to this realization and are, by necessity, beginning to rapidly grow industry partnerships, they are also exposing the limitations on colleges' ability to satisfy the needs of these same industry partners. Those limitations can be considerable. For instance, the industry partner may need a time frame or a specific location that's not permitted within the faculty labor legal agreement. But a college that has the right mindset can, over time, overcome these issues. Many forces conspire to maintain the status quo at colleges. College are, colleges are, are they're big ships that are slow to turn, and academics are not salespeople, and often find marketing tactics and activities distasteful. Public institutions do not like to have public discussions about their problems, partly out of pride and partly out of a legitimate concern that a free-for-all discussion might make the problem seem worse than it is, or might actually make it worse. It's a safe bet that if a college cannot have a genuine discussion about a problem, it's very unlikely to be able to solve that problem. I appreciate your questions, and I hope this information was helpful to you. I hope you're safe and healthy, and I look forward to speaking with you again next week.